Okay, I'll call the meeting back to order. Okay, members, we do not have any executive session items. Just some housekeeping announcements. There's a three minute limit on testimony on second reading public hearing items. One minute limit on all other items. Testifiers, please state your name and whether you support or oppose the items to which you are seeking to offer a testimony. Written testimony, including testifier's address, email address, and phone number may be posted on the city's docu-share. No one shall read someone else's statement. As a courtesy to the members and people in the audience, please turn off all cell phones and pagers. We now move to the order of the day, afternoon calendar, public hearing on mayor's appointments to boards and commissions. Our first appointment is Ricky May Amano, being recommended as an appointee to the Ethics Commission. We do not have any registered speaker at this time, speakers at this time. If the uh, nominee wants to say, open with a few courtesy remarks, if not, we can defer to the subject matter committee. Thank you for considering my nomination and I'm going to defer further comments. Okay, thank you, Judge. Okay, anyone else wishing to offer any uh, comments at this time? If not, members, any discussion? At this juncture, if not, this will be referred to the Committee on Executive Matters and Legal Affairs. Thank you. Okay, members, we now move to second reading public hearing items from the Committee on Public Works and Sustainability, Council Member Chang. I move the committee report 201 be adopted and Bill 38 CD1 pass second reading as amended. Second the motion. Been moved and seconded for the explanation. Regulates to the use, regula, relates to the use of bags provided to customers. Thank you, Council Member. We do have four registered speakers. I'm gonna call them in the order of their registration. Lauren Zerbo, followed by Barbara Amatrod, followed by Davin Takahashi, followed by Shannon Wood. Thank you, Chair and Committee Members. My name is Lauren Zorbel. I'm here on behalf of Hawaii Food Industry Association, which represents retailers, suppliers, and distributors. Uh, we're in opposition to this bill. Um, I was just talking to a few of our members. Even the mid-sized ones um, may see an increase of $10 million, you know, and that's not even the large chains. So this is a serious economic impact. It's a tenfold increase on what they're currently spending. And the worst part is that it does absolutely nothing to encourage reusable bags, which is what we've been saying from the beginning is what people should do. So if we want to encourage people to use reusable bags, that's great. We would support that. Let's put some sort of an incentive for people to use reusable bags. This just increases the cost of groceries for everybody. So we're strongly opposed to it. Um, and we would like to see an, all options that are available, that are possible to be available to be included in this bill, and that includes compostable bags. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Okay, members, any questions for this speaker? No questions? Thank you. Thanks. Barbara Amitrod, followed by Davin Takahashi, followed by Shannon Wood. Good afternoon. Barbara Amitrod, I'm a member of Neighborhood Board 5. Uh, I know whenever I take a reusable bag in a store, they were giving me three cents credit, and lately they've been giving me Hawaiian miles. Also, this fits in a purse, fits in a small purse, and it's a reusable bag. And you just fold it up, doesn't have anybody's name on it, and it's a pretty big bag. And I don't know why people can't just carry them. That's like three other bags. Anyway, I'm for this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions? Devin Takahashi, followed by Shannon Wood. Uh, my name is Devin Takahashi. I support this bill. Um, I know that the bag bill is very controversial, so I think we need another bill to clarify this, and I think this bill clarif clarifies it. Um, I, I do not 100% support the bag bill that was passed a couple of years ago. Um, but um, in our family, we pretty much could adjust to the ban. Um, we have like a whole closet full of uh, Don Quixote empty bags, so uh, we could, you know, uh, go to the store and use the bags. But um, uh, I hearing a lot of people saying that um, the bag ban would uh, mean that uh, the plastic bag would be illegal to hold, so they might have to go to the police station and give the plastic bags to the police department. But um, this bill would clarify this, that you could bring in plastic bags and 
when the ban takes place, you can bring in plastic bags and you could use it. So this bill clarifies clarify it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? If not, Shannon Wood. Good afternoon. My name is Shannon Wood. I am the president of the Windward Ahupua Alliance. And one of the issues that we early on began to remove trash and uh, illegal dumping on Kapa'a Quarry Road between uh, the Kalanui Highway and Mokapu Boulevard. We, I've been working in dozens of other locations here on Oahu as well. However, in 2007, we collected more than 7 million plastic bags in three months here on the island of Oahu. Last week, we uh, took uh, about 250 feet on Kalana on the highway by the Women's Community Correctional Center, and we, four of us collected 1,800 bags in 250, uh, about, uh, about maybe 400 feet. We strongly support this uh, and ur urge that th it doesn't ban small uh, pieces of, of uh, plastic uh, packaging for putting your fruits in and vegetables and stuff like that. And we do now uh, have uh, used, the, used the plastic bags that are uh, collected at the Safeway uh, and Times Market because we have four cats and we want to put the stuff in there <laughs> as well. But I, we strongly support this and have been for over a decade and urge that you pass this bill. The other three counties have it. Uh, and as far as I've been able to identify Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, San Jose, and four, uh, my, my, one of my older brothers lives in Newport Beach, and they have uh, also a, a ban on plastic bags as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wood. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions? Thank you for your testimony. Anyone else on Bill 38 CD1, please come forward. State your name for the record, offer your testimony. Aloha Council Chair Martin um, and Honolulu City Council members. My name is Suzanne Fraser and I'm the co-founder of Beach Environmental Awareness Campaign Hawaii. Beach is in strong support of Bill 38 CD1 as it provides a clear definition of what is to be banned. It bans all plastic checkout bags, including compostable and non-compostable, and it changes the effective date for implementation back to July 2015. The bill also states that paper bags and reusable bags can still be used. Beach strongly supports a ban on all plastic checkout bags, including biodegradable and compostable bags, as all these bags are harmful to marine life that ingests them. All sea turtles in Hawaii are either endangered or threatened, and all sea turtle hatchlings ingest jellyfish, which a floating plastic bag resembles. Compostable and biodegradable plastic bags will also get eaten by marine life, as they act the same as a plastic bag in water. They float the same, they look the same, and they'll harm sea turtles in the same way a plastic bag does, causing blockages, starvation, and eventual death. Once a sea turtle ingests a, a bag, they cannot regurgitate it. It causes the turtle to become positively buoyant and be unable to dive beneath the surface of the water to find food. It takes a sea turtle 60 days to starve to death floating on the surface of the ocean. Other marine life also ingests plastic bags and pieces of plastic bags. Whales and fish have been found to have ingested plastic bags. Tiny pieces of biodegradable plastic bags are the right size to be eaten by plankton. Chemicals from plastic then bioaccumulate through the food chain to humans. And plastic in the ocean also absorbs POPs, which are dioxins, DDT, DDE, which also accumulate on plastic and accumulate through the food chain. So having plastic bags that are, are degrading is not a good thing for the environment. The biggest problem in the ocean in regards to marine debris and on Hawaii's beaches are the very small pieces of plastics. These tiny plastics are very difficult to clean up. This bill will help prevent those tiny pieces of plastic checkout bags from getting into the environment and into the food chain. All types of plastic checkout bags, whether petrochemical based or made of corn, or a plastic bag blended with a starch additive to make it look like it is biodegrading, 
They are all harmful to marine life and need to be banned. So I strongly urge you to please pass Bill 38 CD1. Thank you very much for this opportunity to give testimony today on behalf of Beach. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Bill 38 CD1. Yep, come forward. State your name for the record. Offer your testimony. Hi, my name is Lele Joyshi, and um, I am the conservation chair for Sierra Club o Oahu. Aloha, Chair Martin, and members of the committee. Um, You've heard all the science and the environment, so I won't repeat all of that, but as you know, what I like to do is to bring an interesting point each time I testify. And Pope Francis recently called the, dest the destruction of nature a modern sin. And regardless of your beliefs, um, or if you're atheist or agnostic or anything else, I'd rather, here in Hawaii, I wanna emphasize the idea of kuleana. And whether it's a modern sin or whether it's kuleana, I do know that here, in Hawaii, the average resident, resident produces two times as much opala per day as the average American, but we live here in an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean where, and with our strong trade winds and our poly to sea topography, all of these plastic bags immediately blow into the ocean, whether it's a biodegradable or compostable or a regular plastic bag. And uh, this is something that we need to do something about as a responsibility for the respect of our environment and natural beauty that we have. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions, thank you. Anyone else? Bill 38, CD1. Yep, sir, please come forward. State your name for the record, offer your testimony. Hi there, my name is Danny Kim, president of Koha Foods. Um, and I'm opposed to Bill 38 as it is written. I would like it to include compostable bags and also mandate a fee for supermarkets to charge to its customers. Um, I do not like having paper as our only option to reusable bags. I do not see how paper is more environmentally friendly than compostable bags. It takes significantly more oil, energy, water um, to produce. Certain compostable bags will degrade faster than paper in landfill environments. Technology is constantly improving in this area. Um, compostable bags are easier for cons consumers to use and are more durable and have better second life options as well. Uh, the bill as it's written will cost supermarkets millions of dollars in increased co uh, costs. Um, as Lauren stated earlier, I do have a customer that is currently spending over a million dollars on just regular plastic bags right now. With paper being 10 to 15 times more than that cost, you're looking at a 10 to 15 million dollar cost, increased cost to the supermarkets. Now, the supermarkets don't want to use more plastic bags. They would like to see this number drastically reduced. And I think adding a fee will have a tremendous impact on that. All counties in California do that as well. In Asia, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, all these countries have fees if you want to use plastic bags. And I think that is the direction that we should go towards. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions? Anyone else? Bill 38, CD1. Anyone else? If not, I'm going to have to close the public testimony. You guys got Aloha, okay. Chair Martin, Vice Chair Anderson, Holland City uh, Council members. My name is Tina Tsuki, and I'm in strong support of Bill 38, CD1, which would ban all plastic checkout bags, including the biodegradable plastic bags and compostable bags on Oahu. Uh, there's no such thing as a biodegradable plastic bag. Uh, plastic photodegrades into smaller and smaller pieces, but it does not biodegrade. Uh, plastic lasts forever. Um, adding an additive to plastic bag makes the bag break down into smaller pieces of plastic faster. Plastic breaking down faster because of additives in the plastic is much more difficult to clean up than a whole bag. Bits of plastic can blow all over, including the ocean where marine life, such as plankton, can easily ingest small pieces of plastic. When plastic is ingested at the bottom of the food chain, Chemicals released from the plastic migrate into the animal, which gets passed up the food chain to humans. Uh, this bill will prevent tiny pieces of plastic bags from getting in the food chain. Um, compostable bags do not leave any toxic chemicals when biodegrading, but when, when in the ocean, it, it still can look like a plastic bag, which can fool sea turtles into thinking that it is a jellyfish. When plastic is ingested by sea turtles, they may cause blockages or starvation because the turtle feels, uh, feels full. Thus, shifting, shifting from plastic biodegradable bags to compostable bags uh, is detrimental to marine life. 
Our grandparents didn't have plastic bags, and they got along fine with bringing their own reusable bags or baskets or used paper bags. And these days, most paper bags are 100% recycled paper. You know, Costco doesn't have any shopping bags, and no one ever complains. And Maui and Hawaii Islands uh, bag bans are working fine, so why can't Oahu do the same here? Another issue is people with dogs. Um, they always complain that they need a plastic bag. Well, people can always get plastic bags from the newspaper, bread, chips, bagels, uh, bags, vegetables, fruits, prepared foods, or use even paper bags or, or newspaper. Um, we have to really think about the next, um, our next generations and what state of the environment we have to leave them. So please pass Bill 38 CD1. Thank you for this opportunity to provide written um, oral testimony. Hola. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? Not anyone else? Okay. And anyone else after this handsome gentleman? Anyone oh, else? right on. Aloha, Start council members. I know his father. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's Kahi Pokaro, Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii. Um, just wanted to add that we passed the bag ban already. Um, this is only meant to fill the loopholes that industry was already getting ready to fill with. They wanted to substitute plastic bags with just adding some additives to it so they could continue to use these plastic bags. They're still just as much as dangerous as those plastic bags. Um, so we strongly support this bill. Um, and I also wanted to add that I'm sure you've already seen it in town, maybe here on the uh, windward side as well, the new uh, state bird. It's not the cranes, it's the plastic bags. And I hope by passing this bill, we can stop this from continuing to be our state bird. Thank you. Okay, members, any questions for the testifier? No questions? Anyone else? Bill 38, CD1. Now, members, we are moving to discussion. Any discussion, members, on Bill 38, CD1? Council Member Fukunaga? You know, I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't uh, able to um, find out more about some of the legislation that has been adopted in other jurisdictions. You know, um, I understand that those jurisdictions that have imposed a fee on single-use bags do appear to be um, encouraging residents to shift out of their use. So I would um, hope that during the next round of discussions in the committee that some discussion can be um, had on the question of whether or not uh, providing some sort of fee might also help us achieve the intended outcome as, um, as has been stated. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Harimoto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In strong support of this, um, I think we've heard from the testifiers uh, today and in, in the past all the reasons why we need to do this. Um, but just in response to some of the discussion about the fee um, in past um, years, I guess uh, we've learned that the council, the city is not empowered to charge a fee for bags. And, um, unless the state legislature authorizes that, uh, that's not an option for us. But again, just to clarify, as one of the testifiers said, uh, this bill is only trying to clarify the law that already exists. So um, it, I think, um, just as, as was said, closes a loophole. And I really would encourage uh, my fellow council members to support this. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion, members? Any further discussion? Is not Vice Chair Anderson? No? Okay, just, to, just to let you know, I'll, I'll be voting in opposition to this particular bill. I think uh, I have concerns I've expressed before, uh, but this will proceed back to subject matter committee. I'm sure it'll pass out today in capable hands of subject matter chair Stanley Chang. But I'll be working with Council Member Chang perhaps to propose other amendments to this particular bill as it moves forward. Okay, anyone else voting in opposition? Noting opposition from myself and Vice Chair Anderson. Any reservations, members? Reservations from Council Members Fukunaga, Pine. Okay. Committee Report 201 has been adopted and Bill 38 CD1 has passed third reading. A uh, second reading, passed second reading. Okay, from the Committee on Zoning and Planning, Vice Chair Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that Committee Reports 205 through 208 be adopted and Bills 42, 43, 45, and 46 all pass second reading. It's been moved and seconded for the explanation, Vice Chair Anderson. Bill 42 relates to public sidewalks. Bill 43 relates to urinating and defecating in public. Bill 45 relates to public sidewalks. Bill 46 relates to urinating and defecating in public. 
Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. We have a number of registered testifiers to expedite matters. We're gonna accept testimony on all bills. So when you come forward, we are gonna grant leeway to allow you to testify on any of the bills uh, on the calendar, on the page four and page five, that's bills 42, 43, 45, and 46. First registered testifier, Lucia Yu, followed by Susan M. Schultz, followed by Dave Moskowitz. Any of them here? Come, come forward, if I called your name. Doesn't have to be in the order, you can just come forward. Just state your name for the record. Thank you, my name is Susan Schultz. I'm here on my own behalf. Uh, I, I am not a specialist in public uh, policy. However, I am an English professor, and I wanted to address some of the language that's being used in the bills and in support of the bills. One of the essays I teach in my courses at UH is George Orwell's Politics in the English Language in which he argues that euphemism, especially in political speech and writing, are largely the defense of the indefensible. And when I read about these issues and what politicians are saying about them, for the most part, I find a defense of the indefensible. Let me pull out one quotation by Mayor Caldwell, which was published nationally in the New York Times on the 26th of June, and let, then let me have a little English professor moment with it. We haven't eliminated the visual impact of homelessness, Mr. Caldwell said. When visitors come here, they want to see their paradise. They don't want to see homeless people sleeping in parks or on sidewalks or on the beach. He's talking about the visual impact of homelessness, not on the homeless themselves, but on people from the outside who want to come here and they want to see what they want to see, which is paradise. So his emphasis for the New York Times was on outsiders coming in who do not want to see the homeless. Then, even better, he says, I want to do this in a constitutional way, a human way, but I want to do it. We need to do it. I call it compassionate disruption. We are not doing it without heart. I go to the Oxford English Dictionary, I look up compassionate. It means suffering for, suffering with, feeling the suffering of other people. I look up the word disruption. It says violent rendering, rending away. How are you supposed to combine compassion with disruption, especially for people who are homeless, which strikes me to be a rather profound disruption of one's life to begin with? So. Um, the, the bills themselves contain a lot of language which, which suggests that the homeless are unhealthy, but that what we really want is a healthy economy. So consider simply the use of the word health here. We want a healthy economy, and so we're gonna get rid of the homeless. But what I think is really at stake here is, as I think we all know, but we're not saying, is money. Behind the rhetoric of these bills in front of you, hidden, uh, besides the homeless themselves, what's being hidden is that this all is all about money. Who is to pay for the poorest among us? I gather it's the poorest among us who are supposed to pay a $1,000 fine for breaking these proposed laws, and if they can't pay $1,000, then they end up in prison anyway, and then we pay for their housing, but at least they aren't seen at that point. So let me just say in conclusion that if you're gonna pass these bills, please at least be honest in your language about them. What you're doing is you are proposing to protect businesses and sweep away real human beings because they are unsightly and have no resources. If you're gonna do this, at least announce what you're going to do. You're gonna be paying to house people in prison where visitors to paradise, to say nothing of anyone who can spend a million bucks to 20 million in condos in Kaka'ako cannot see them. You're privatizing blame and cost while our social contract is being used to exclude some to the benefit of others. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? Not thank you. Okay, Dave Moskowitz, followed by Tom Berg, followed by Caroline Kong. Good afternoon, Chair Martin, council members. Um, I'm here in support of Bill 42. 
Um, I ran into the mayor a couple Saturdays ago on the beach after the beach cleanup, and we had a nice conversation. I think some of you received my email and some ideas I had of ways to address the issue of homelessness in Waikiki. And in disagreement with my friends, uh, progressive friends, I don't think many of you actually spend any time in Waikiki. I do. I work for a business in Waikiki. Our business has been affected financially, but it's not just the homeless. It's the drug dealing, it's the prostitution, which still continues. There's a, a Walmart of drug dealing at Kapahulu Groin, and it's been going on for years in front of Play Bar. All these issues need to be addressed. They all affect commerce. So it's not just that. So that's just one issue that needs to be resolved to affect a better economic environment in Waikiki. Uh, I think the excuses on dealing with the prostitution from the people that enforce those laws, I mean, I get, I get approached all the time. They make economic offers to me. I've seen them taking money out of ATMs. I know all the drug dealers because I work a lot in front of the restaurant where I work. And they, you can see them wandering up and down the streets. And the homeless, however, I don't have any tolerance for some of these people. Um, there, there is choice, 70% of them, I believe, is what the fact, uh, the figure is. Uh, they're different than the people outside of Waikiki. I don't think they're going to leave Waikiki because they will be at physical risk, to be perfectly frank. Most of them want to go there because it's safe and, of course, the money's there. And I made some suggestions as to what to do. But, and as far as the lawsuits go, I don't think ACLU has done much of anything lately, frankly, for any of us progressive people in the movement. And one of the things I'm concerned about and I know Councilwoman Kobayashi will know about this, is how this is going to affect the street artists. In Ordinance 1029, Bill 39, an idea that I came up with, which never got implemented because it was a half million dollars to measure the sidewalks, that's a small figure compared to what we spent so far. Um, there's a thing that says that there has to be two chairs. Now, they're starting, the homeless are starting to use chairs because I think they're going to get away with using chairs to sit on, and I hope, and we make this clear, Two chairs are allowed, and they're not part of the square footage allowed under that ordinance. However, some people, HPDD, is giving tickets to the street artists, including the chairs. I think there needs to be training on this subject. So certain people enforce this law only, and you're going to need to need oh, three to four times the amount of police in Waikiki to be able to take care of it. And it has to be, I hate to say it, but onerous. And it has to be regular, and it has to be consistent. If not, it's not going to work. So I'm, I figure we'll give it to October to see how all this works out. And did you know the shelters are full? The shelters are full. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions? Thank you, sir. Tom Berg, followed by Caroline Kong, followed by Arvid Youngquist. Tom Berg, not here. Caroline Kong, is she here? Oh, coming forward, no. please. Aloha, I'm Caroline Cohen. The, ex the excellent first speech or speaker took half my speech, but um, I'm going to share. I went back and forth between I was going to speak about my grandfather who worked on Skid Row in Los Angeles in the 60s, but and this story, but I chose to share this story about someone famous to illustrate my opposition to Bill 42. There's a statue that depicts Jesus as a person sleeping on a park bench at St. Albums Episcopal Church, and they installed a homeless Jesus statue on his property in the middle of an upscale neighborhood filled with well-kept townhomes in North Carolina. Jesus is huddled under a blanket with his face and hands obscured. Only the crucifixion wounds on his uncovered feet give him away. The reaction was immediate in the neighborhood. Some loved it, some didn't. One woman from the neighborhood actually called police the first time she drove by. She thought it was an actual homeless person. That's right, somebody called the cops on Jesus. I was concerned for the safety of the neighborhood, she said. On finding out she called the police on a work of art, the woman stated, Jesus is not a vagrant. Jesus is not a helpless person who needs our help. We need someone who is capable of meeting our needs, not someone who is also needy. Reverend David Buck disagreed, saying that this was a relatively affluent church. And to be honest, we need to be reminded ourselves that our faith, and perhaps you, can, you folks could replace that your public service 
could express itself in active concern for the marginalized of society. The sculpture is intended as a visual translation of the passage in the book of Matthew in which Jesus tells his disciples, as you did, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. As you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. It is also a great lesson for those used to seeing Jesus depicted in traditional religious art as the Christ of glory enthroned in all his finery. We believe that that's the kind of life Jesus had, Buck says. He was, in essence, a homeless person. We're, we're reminded of what our climate I'm sorry, our ultimate calling is as Christians, as people of faith or people of public service, to do what we can individually and systematically to eliminate homelessness. Buck said, part of faith commitment is to care for the needy. He added, I can't understand why anyone wouldn't want this. And back in Honolulu, as the first speaker pointed out, it really is all about money. At the first, at the groundbreaking of, of Waiea, okay, I'm gonna have to wrap it up. But the excellent first speaker pointed out that it is about money. And we were cited nationally from the National Coalition of Homelessness that Honolulu is driving homeless people out of sight because they want tourists to have a better view of the beach. Instead of arresting people for being poor, city officials should get their housing market under control and provide real solutions. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions. Thank you. Arvid Youngquist, followed by Rick Igyed, followed by Max Sard, followed by Doug Matulka. Chair, member of the council, um, for a moment, I thought we had an absent council member, but maybe that's a crack in the two tables. I almost missed this council meeting uh, because I thought it would be the regular location uh, adjacent to the now empty city council. Um, we've had other meetings held in this very room, so it's, it's a good location. In fact, my brother stayed 14 years just up the hill in the state hospital. I'm quite aware of what homelessness means. And some of you have heard me mention this history of mine. Age four through age 12, I match and exceed the record of trustee Frenchie de Soto in the number of times I ran away from home. Luckily, I never was sent to prison. I have been in detention in police stations. Once I actually broke out and never got caught. And that's the history. You know, one of the morning agenda items by Council Member Ramenor, I believe, Bill 48, is probably the only alternative you can pursue because it's across the county, uh, not just for Waikiki or downtown. And if you're not gonna come up with funding for more prisons, for mandatory sentencing, well, may as well fix a defective effective date. You know, there's a poem called One. You cried that the world was full of hungry people. I cite the poem loosely. Feed one. You cry that the world is full of people with no shelter over their head. Shelter one. You cry that the world is full of people with no clothes. Clothes one. You cry that we are in a desperate situation. So I sent you one on the cross. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions? Thank you. Thank you, Arvid.
Rick Igid, followed by Max Sword, followed by Doug Matuoka. Good afternoon, Chair Martin, Vice Chair Anderson, members of the Council. My name is Rick Igid. I'm the President of the Waikiki Improvement Association. I believe you have my written testimony, so I won't uh, go over the written testimony, but I would like to say that this has, uh, so I'm testifying in favor of both Bills 42 and 43. And I, you know, I listened to the English professor who gave her testimony. And, and I think that the important thing to, to realize here is that we're not just talking, this is not just an issue about homeless people sleeping or sitting on the sidewalk. Yes, some of the people who camp out basically on the sidewalks in Waikiki are homeless. But the, there are others who are not. Uh, I look at some of our, our uh, regulars on the sidewalk in Waikiki, and frankly, I don't think they are homeless. I've listened to them talk, asked them questions, and I think they're able to make enough money panhandling on the street of Waikiki that they're not homeless. So I don't think it's an issue of just talking about homeless. So I, I believe we need to focus in on what these two bills do actually do not debate the general issue of whether we should help homeless people or not. Of course we should. Of course we should. This council is in the lead on doing exactly that with all the money that has been appropriated. City administration is very active in doing that. Let's not make this a, oh, oh, do we, are we in favor of homeless people or are we just trying to get rid of them? That's, that's not the issue that we're discussing here today. What we're discussing here today is whether we can keep the sidewalks in Waikiki available for the general public, for our visitors, for the purpose they're, they're there for, which is to get from one place to another within Waikiki. And in terms of the, the Bill 43, urination and defecation, can we maintain sanitary conditions in an area that is certainly our biggest and most prominent commercial area in the state? And so that's, that's what we're talking about here today. And so uh, I would urge your support for both Bill 42 and 43 and certainly, this is not the answer to homeless issues, even in Waikiki. It's only one more tool in the, basically the, the, the city's quiver to be able to keep Waikiki in good shape, keep the, the streets, the sidewalks clear in Waikiki, and to maintain sanitary conditions, good conditions, in a place that's important to all of us. So I would strongly support that uh, strongly urge that you support Bill 42 and 43. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Members, any questions for the testifier? Vice Chair Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Egan, what is your position? I'm the president of the Waikiki Improvement Association. Can you share with the council uh, the dollars generated in Waikiki in transit accommodations taxes per year? Well, uh, I don't have the number right off the tip of my tongue, because, but I did what the, the figure that I was able to come up with by comparing the, the property tax dollars that were generated just in Waikiki plus the uh, TAT that, the White, that, the, that is the county share of the TAT comes to about 20% of all the taxes the city and county of Honolulu collects. Uh, and of course, the state collects even more. So um, I can certainly get you the exact numbers, but I, I, I think that the, the important fact is, I don't think, and I don't think it's a, a, a real question in anybody's mind, that Waikiki is the biggest uh, single generator in terms of geographic areas of, of uh, economic activity in the state. And I don't want to uh, turn this into an entire financial issue, Mr. Egan, but would you agree that the fact of the matter is if visitors stop coming to Waikiki and there being less money coming into our economy, that government has a harder time paying its bills and providing the services that we are expected to provide to our taxpayers. To our taxpayers and to be able to work on the homeless issues. I mean, there's no question that, that Waikiki is uh, uh, an issue here because it's where the money is. And that, that's the money that helps us to, do all, to address all the issues that we have in our community. So without monies coming into our economy, we have a difficult time paying our firefighters, paying our police officers, uh, paying our professors. Everybody suffers. Correct. Thank you very much. I would really appreciate uh, sure, I can the data on the uh, 
transit accommodations tax dollars on average uh, mm -hmm. that come in per year in Waikiki, that'd be very helpful. And I do have those numbers. In fact, I, in my youth, I was been able to remember them and tell you right off the top of my head. But as I'm getting older, for some reason, I'm having a little harder time pulling those numbers out at when I need them. <laughs> I just remember when our visitor industry dropped some years ago, the economy suffered. Absolutely. In fact, and the recovery of our economy was, was, was no question led by Waikiki. At the time when the rest of the country was still suffering, uh, Hawaii's economy was recovering, and it was on the shoulders of Waikiki's increased uh, visitor arrivals at a time when visitor arrivals were not increasing at other destinations across the country. So the fact that so much was invested in Waikiki and that we have, as a community, are, have done such a good job in, uh, with Waikiki that it is such a desirable destination. Thank you very much, Mr. Egan. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Any further questions for the testifier? No further questions. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Max Sword, followed by Doug Matsuoka, followed by Barbara Amachot. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Martin, members of the Council, Max Sword here on behalf of Outrigger Hotels in support of uh, Bill 42 and 43. Um, Mr. Eger, I think, said everything that needs to be said about the importance of this bill. And I know that there's others that think that uh, there's other ways to do it, but uh, we totally disagree. Um, we've been in business for 60 some, 67 years, and this is one of the toughest problems that we've ever faced. Uh, we as an industry have uh, worked with, uh, are working with the uh, city in getting issues taken care of, such as uh, working to open up the bathrooms uh, 24 hours, um, and as well as supporting uh, organizations su such as the Waikiki Community Center uh, in their effort to uh, support the homeless. And let's not forget, there's also residents in Waikiki that this also affects. And if we do nothing, um, Pardon the pun, we might as well be shishing it off uh, Waikiki down the drain. So thank you allowing for, for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Okay, Vice Chair Anderson has a question for you, sir. <coughs> Mr. Sword, is Outrigger in discussions with the Caldwell administration as to what types of partnerships that you'd be willing to enter into with the city to provide for additional restroom facilities and such so that we have places for people to be able to, facilities for people to be able to use? Uh, we, have, uh, we have allowed Mr. Eggert and WIA, and as well as the uh, Waikiki Business Improvement District to take the lead on that. And we are in support and they are? of, uh, I'm sorry? And they are? Uh, yes, uh, WIA, uh, Rick probably uh, can uh, talk to the specifics, but part of it is also uh, supporting through the BI, uh, Waikiki Business Improvement District, the uh, Op uh, reopening for 24 hours the uh, uh, bathrooms at Alonco, uh, Kalakau Avenue. Would you, would you like me to answer? Please, thank uh, you. Uh, yes, thank you for the, for the question. Uh, our Waikiki Business Improvement District Association, it's a separate organization from WIA, but uh, that was actually created under the auspices of the city and county of Honolulu, uh, is working with the city on uh, trying, to, to, trying to set up a plan to keep the restrooms open 24 mm -hmm. hours. Keep that, at least that particular restroom, the one by the police substation, open 24 hours. The BID is offered to provide funds or people. And so the issue is, is uh, they're, they're, they're trying to resolve is to come up with a, a way that it works within the city's apparatus, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. from the standpoint of relationships with their personnel and the, the, de so the Department of Parks. They would have to change, make a change because the, or an exception because the, of the park rules because that part of the park is closed at, at, at one point during the, during the night. So that restroom would, would have to be made an exception so that that restroom could be remain open even though the rest of the park was closed. So there's little details that have to be worked out but we're actively working with them and we expect them to get resolved. So the Improvement Association has in fact made a commitment to provide money other resources to make restroom facilities available for longer hours. That it, that's, you have done that. As long that. as it can be worked out with the city, yes. I mean, obviously it's still city property, so. Sure. But you have let the mayor know that you're committed yes. to doing that. Yes. yes. Through the BID. Through the BID, yes. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions for the testifier? Nope. Thank you. Doug Matsuoka, 
followed by Barbara Amistrad, followed by Mr. David Connell. Aloha Chair Martin, uh, Vice Chair Anderson, and the Consul. Uh, for the record, my name is H. Doug Matsuok. I'm with the Hawaii Guerrilla Video Hui. I strongly oppose the endless uh, slew of bills criminalizing homelessness, specifically Bill 42, 43, 45, 46, and now 48. Um, I submitted written testimony, and I won't be uh, repeating it at, at this point, uh, except to say that I've documented and seen firsthand the midnight raids on the homeless. I say midnight raids, but usually they're at 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., and I've witnessed HPD and city crews taking and destroying uh, bedding, tents, clothing, food uh, from the people on the sidewalk. I, I do have a few words to read, however, uh, and this is going to be a quote. We need to find a better way to help Oahu's homeless population, including, including those who deal with mental health issues or addictions. The Housing First model focuses on providing shelter first before addressing other issues a person may have. Once housed, the person may take, then take advantage of social services available on site. This approach has worked well in many mainland cities and is worthy of our attention. These aren't my words. These are the words for candidate for mayor, Kirk Caldwell. <laughs> now, Chair Martin, on June 12th, the mayor, now as mayor and not candidate, sent you a, uh, and the council a message containing drafts of bills 42 and 43 uh, that would criminalize the homeless and subject them to up to a $1,000 fine and 30 days in jail. So I need to ask, when did Satan get a hold of this guy's heart, you know? And why are you guys helping him? I'm serious about this. The, the mayor's message to the council says, and I'm reading it, with the council's support, I anticipate that together we can make significant improvements for our Waikiki businesses, workers, and visitors. The mayor does not mention the public or even the residents of Honolulu, let alone the homeless. These bills are clearly not for public good. They're for boosting the profit of tourist industry corporations. Now, for as long as I can remember, and everyone else here who's a local person, they can, uh, they'll agree with me, that we've been hearing that we have to take care of the tourist industry. But you know what? Think about it. It's the tourist industry that has to take care of us. That's why we tolerate them here. The tourist industry has failed in this. The more money the tourist industry makes, the more homeless people are on the sidewalk. In the past five years, as the tourist industry has grown to enjoy record revenue and profits, the homelessness has grown 30% in that same period of time. Now, like everyone else, I have friends in the tourist industry and who make money off of it, like, like Dave back here. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to put them down. But, you know, I'm an old guy. I understand. And I've always done what I need to do to get by. But has it come to this? You know, are we going to throw members of the community in jail because they can't afford housing in the most expensive place to, to find housing? Yeah, just the other day, the median cost of a single-family home hit $700,000, okay? Why are there people on the sidewalk? Um, now, I'm going to remind you guys, and you're not going to like it, that politics is supposed to be a public service, you know? Um, uh, it's your duty to serve the people, not the tourist industry. Those guys are rich. They can hire their, their own guys. You guys are supposed to work for us, you know? So I exhort you to cast off your indenture to corporate, corporate profitability. Your duty is to, the, to serve the public. So do not criminalize the poor. Do your duty and kill these bills. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any, any questions? questions for the testifier? No questions. Thank you, sir. Barbara Amatrod, followed by David Connell. And Catherine Yellow, our final testifier, registered testifier. Okay. Hi, Barbara Armentrout. I'm a member of Neighborhood Board 5, but I'm speaking as an individual. I've lived here since 1967, and when did this all become such an issue? When I grew up, was in Waikiki, worked in Waikiki, never had problems with going to the restroom. As a resident of Hawaii, didn't have problems trying to find a restroom anywhere. 
just a resident going around and having to go, you think, oh gosh, where am I gonna go? Because nobody wants you in there unless you're using their restroom or using their restaurant or whatever. I support the bills as Bill 42. It's not just for the visitors, Waikiki Special District. Every resident on Oahu is special. There's people lying on sidewalks, blocking sidewalks on 12th Avenue and, and Kaimaki. It's not just happening in Waikiki. Um, also on 43 and 46, I was at the Date Street bus stop and there was a golfer on the Alawai golf course. He came over to the utility box, pulled down his pants, went to the bathroom on the utility box. Okay, so it's happening everywhere. We need more bathrooms in public places for our residents, whether they're taxpayers or homeless. As for having only one restroom at rail stations, that's ludicrous. Traveling to and from rail on buses and the need to relieve themselves, there's only going to be one, and then you're going to have to find the person at the bus sta or at the rail station with the key. They're not built yet. They should put two, two bathrooms there with the plumbing now. If you don't want to open it, fine. Make one a pay one. I would pay to go to the bathroom if there's a bathroom there. And if Honolulu is to be an age-friendly city certified by the World Health Organization, we need restrooms for sanitary reasons and because it's humane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions? No questions. Thank you. David Connell, do we have a mic for David? Yeah, right here. Okay, right, right here. sir. Go ahead. Okay. Um, th this is about. Um, lying and miss uh, lying on the, the sidewalks, right? And defecation. Yes. And, all the okay. bills, sir. Okay. First of all, hold on a second. Let me get a little closer. I want to present you and the council with a poop pad. Each one of you need one of these because you never know. Come on. Um, could somebody pass these out to the council so each one can have a poop pad? And I have a question for you. I have a question for you. So if if we Pull down our pants. Um, th th is that exposing ourselves? So that, that becomes against the law too, right? How, how, how do you poop and pee? You pull down your pants. This little thing is wonderful too. But uh, w when you're in an emergency, it's a urinal. Every hospital has these things. Well, you know what? Oh, by the way, who knows when you're going to have to do a, you're going to have to um, uh, poop and, and pee. So, um, Actually, you, you can buy these things for about five, six bucks, you know? And, and you know what? I, I don't know about you, but there's been times when, when I couldn't wait. And, and, and you know what? I am homeless, so but, and I've, I found these poop pads indispensable. But you know what? If I ever got caught <laughs> pulling down my pants and pooping on the pad, just like, you know, like we do for dogs, right? We, 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 the dog poops on the sidewalk. We, we take our little plastic bag, we rip, and then we put it in the trash. Is, is that legal for human doo-doo to go in the trash, you know? Is, is it? I'm asking you guys. Is it, or, or is it only dog doo-doo? You, you guys don't know. You don't understand. Uh, anyway, we, we folks without homes, I don't like to say homeless. We, we, know. We, we know. We know because we don't have a place to go a lot of times. And, and so we're expected to poop in our pants. Is that it? Have you, have you, have you, any of you folks have ever pooped in your pants? It's, an, it's not a very fun thing. I've smelled peep, homeless folks that pooped in their pants, and it doesn't, it's not a very nice uh, uh, thing to have to do. Anyway, this lying and sitting thing, too, I, I, I just can't. Um, you know, if, if, if folks are so down and out, exhausted and confused, that they're lying down and sleeping on the sidewalks. If lawmakers are then writing and passing laws prohibiting it, very likely, likely there needs to be um, uh, more thorough and honest examination of the corruption and political failures that have gotten Hawaii in this sad state. You know, and um, I want each one of you to have one of these things. And I, I'd be happy to to talk to any of you folks about all kinds of wonderful alternatives for homeless people instead of just um, uh, 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 
very expensive rentals, uh, it's even these city rentals, that can happen. But you folks at the council and the mayor have to get together and talk about rezoning a few things. And you have to talk about safe zones. So people can be away from the tourists and the business community that, that complain to you folks on a daily basis, I bet. I bet they're complaining to you folks on every day. Can you get these people out of our way so we can, so we all can enjoy it? Because you know what? Some of us, I, I go down to, uh, on Hotel Street and I see pe uh, people living in terrible squalor. And you know, it, it just hurts my heart. I, I, it, it, it's, it's so sad to, to, that we, as the most wealthiest country in the world, are letting these people end their life on the god darn streets. And you know, you know what the longevity of a, of, of a chronic homeless person is? About 50. So you, you, you're denying about 30 more years of, of life. And it, it, that chronic, it's a miserable life. And I, I, I'm asking you, any, any of you ever been homeless for a day or two or a week or a month? Or ever been in a homeless shelter? I dare you, I dare you to spend a week or two in a homeless shelter. I dare you to go out on the street with bro broke, with nothing, nothing, with, with, with dirty clothes. Everything was stolen from you. You don't have an ID. You don't have an ID. You can't even get darn food stamps. And, and, and you're hungry. And, 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 and you're lonely. And you're down and out. And, 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 and you try to get help. And, and no, no one is giving you help. You know? So anybody, anybody. Okay, so you guys have no idea. You have, have a very... Mr. Canal, when I have to connect. ask you to come to a conclusion. Okay, yeah. And well, my conclusion is I'm challenging you folks to get out of your box and, 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 and actually maybe go in a cardboard box. And I, I, I'm challenging you folks to, to, to really get serious about uh, changing the, uh, the, the, the making sure no, no one goes home, has to go, has to live on the street. That can be done on a whole lot less money than now. Cause I, I know, because I, I know homeless folks, we, 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 we could write up a, a, a ways to, I mean, uh, a, there's many ways. I'd, and if any of you folks would like to discuss it with me and some other um, of my friends that are homeless. Okay, we, Mr. We can Canal, I'm going to have to, ideas. I'm gonna okay. have to end your testimony. Sure. Okay, thank you, uh, sir. Aloha. Yeah, thank By you. By the way, um, I, can, I pass these out to you. The clerk will grab it from yeah. you. Thank you, sir. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions, thank you. <laughs> you can't take the microphone with you. I know some of you would like to. Catherine, Ms. Catherine is our final testifier. Anyone else wishing to offer a t public testimony, you can line up behind Catherine. So state your name for the record, offer your testimony. Aloha. Okay. My name is Catherine Gian, and I'm, with, I'm the executive director of the Pacific Alliance to Stop Slavery. With all due respect to the business industry, um, they have every right to want a quick fix to the problem of homelessness. Um, there's a very big problem with homelessness in Hawaii, but there is no quick fix to this, and that's where they're mistaken. With all due respect to Mr. Egged and um, the representative from the outrigger, whose name eludes me right now. Um, these measures do not work, and we've seen this over and over again in other cities, if we've done our homework. And it's only led to a tax on taxpayers who bear the burden to fund these programs. And speaking of funding, by the way, I've heard many people boast about the city council, with all due respect again, uh, about allocating 47 million to housing first programs and housing programs. But, What's not talked about is the fact that the operational costs were not fully funded. So we'll talk about this and talk about this when it is convenient for us, but then when it comes to implementation, we fall very short. Is that fair? No. Now back to these um, quick fixes. Criminalizing homelessness would only lead to an overburden of our already overburdened uh, prison systems which is also another cost we would have to bear. And then we would spit these uh, homeless people back out on the street, and where do you think they're gonna go back to? 
exactly where they started, right in front of your hotels, by the beaches, everywhere. Now, we've, that's why we need to focus on the root cause. That's why I disagree with Mr. Egged about this not being related to the homeless. You cannot separate the constitutional effects of these, uh, these pieces of legislation that are proposed. You cannot do that. Please do not. Because the effects affect people on a grand scale because they threaten our constitutional rights. Now let's start with Bill 50, uh, 43. Not entirely opposed to this bill, but you need to add a criminal intent. Add the language malicious intent or reckless disregard that excludes people with bowel control problems, the elderly especially, and especially the elderly homeless, and little children. Difficulties, now let me just surprise you to the difficulties of, of accessing shelter because the mayor himself publicly on many occasions said that the reasons for these bills were to target the homeless and to force them into shelters in some sort of tough love tactic. Now let me tell you about these requirements for these shelters. First of all, you need ID, okay? Now if you were caught in a city raid at two o'clock in the morning, your ID would be confiscated. As you all well know, you pass those bills as a necessity, and that necessity includes IDs. If you don't have an ID as a homeless person, you can't get into the shelter. If you do have an ID, you have to be a Hawaii resident, and if you're not a Hawaii resident and you do have ID, you have to pay up to $300 to stay in these shelters. Did you know that? Passing criminalizing bills, forcing the extreme poor into shelters is not only internment, it's extortionate if these shelters require payment to receive services. Did you know that? No, you probably didn't. And that is why I beg you to rethink and find out what's going on on the ground level with regard to the homeless and the, and the state of the shelters, which they also suffer. People who actually go to these shelters and stay there complain of abuse, ranging from simple discrimination to rape, even in single gendered shelters. Parents are separated uh, from their children as penalty for doing things like declining to take a computer class. Is that fair? No. Do they have access to justice so that people like you can hear about these grievances? No. They do not have access to justice. Also, the abuse of the sweeps. I have interviewed many homeless people who are subject to these sweeps. And uh, they, uh, the city officials have done things like taken walkers from seniors who would not be able to walk without them. So they would have to sit down on the sidewalk or lie down on the sidewalk because they have no walkers. It was confiscated by the city. I've talked to people who have had their heart medication taken, diabetes medication taken because it was classified as a necessity. And I've talking to, talked to families who have been abused by these sweeps whose baby's pampers were taken. So my agency had to throw a fundraiser to provide all of the things that the city took. Is this fair? I beg you, I beg you to find your hearts and exercise your heart muscle because this is where state differs from corporations. Your bottom line is not the end all be all. Your bottom line is the Constitution, which I beg you to uphold. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions? Anyone else? Please come forward. State your name for the record. Arvid, you cannot testify. You testified already on these bills. I, you did testify. I have your name right here on my list. No, I, I said I was consolidating testimony for all bills. I made an announcement, sir. You did. I heard it. Okay, you but need you to sit, sit down. down. Sit down. I'll sit down. Okay, but you've already wait. testified. Go ahead. Chun Jane Sonkahuku. Um, I want to make comments on all the consolidated bills, um, but I do want to very assuredly say that I would like to see safeguards put into all the bill. The reason why I'm saying that is, and I know I've said it again, but I will say it again that under the guise of Bill 44, also known as the sidewalk bill, the mayor, Mayor Kurt Cotwell, came into my private property, that of which I'm, was a, I'm still a fee owner, 
and I paid property taxes. And he came, he sent 12 employees from Halava uh, Maintenance Yard, six policemen, one front end loader, one dump truck to come into my fee owned property to take away my free speech signs. Now, so I had to file a lawsuit out of my civil duty. I filed a lawsuit in August. If you can hold it for me. I filed a lawsuit in August in the federal court. In September, he asked the real property taxes to return all my property taxes. It came out to about $20,000 he sent me back in refund. And again, I want to say that how we take care of the vo most vulnerable in our society reflects on our own self. And again, the most vulnerable people would not have the resources that I have to go and try to get some justice in the courts of law because it's very expensive. And also, that lawsuit is still pending and the mayor has actually assigned three attorneys to that case. So I'm just saying today that on behalf of those people, the most vulnerable, that whenever we make laws and whenever we make bills, there must be safeguard against bullying, against injustice, because it can if it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. So that to me is, a, I hope is a very uh, strong message that can be sent to everyone that we need the safeguard. I don't know how you're gonna do it, you know, I have great respect for all, all of you, and I know that you no, will not do it. But if we have a mayor, like Mayor Cod Codwell, who is willing to hide behind Bill 54 to intimidate and to taunt us, and I'm not a homeless, and I would not consider myself a vulnerable person, and yet it could be done to me. Uh, may I also just add to change our pace a little bit regarding Bill 43? Um, I believe that part of the uh, problem is that we have that federal law of the ADA where people have to comply with the ADA. So I know a lot of my friends who own business no longer open their um, uh, restroom to the public because if, if it's still a public restroom, they have to renovate, they have to find space to make, it, make sure that it's ADA compliant. And so it's actually easier to close them than have to try to comply with it. But I do believe that it's the city's responsibility, basic responsibility, to provide some free restrooms. So thank you very much. Um, I, I also have problems with the word compassionate disruption. It does, it does not get together. It does not rhyme. So thank you very much, and please, there must be safeguards to protect the public from, from bullying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions. Next testifier. Yeah, come forward. State your name for the record. Offer your testimony. Aloha. I'm Lele Shi, and I'm testifying on behalf of myself today. I'm an oceanographer and a consultant. And um, I am against these bills that are here today. I'm actually here. Um, by serendipity, but I've actually worked with homeless people for over 15 years now. I started in early high school um, where I would actually feed homeless people in front of the Palo Alto City Council. And uh, since then, I've started chapters of an organization called Food Not Bombs in Santa Barbara and Albuquerque, where the idea is to feed fellow people healthy hot meals, which would give them the platform to give attention to other aspects of uh, their lives. Consequently, I've gotten to personally know a number of these people um, one man uh, was a normal person like you and I, um, had a house, had a job, had a wife. His baby daughter died in his arms of SIDS. And from then, uh, he, he lost his job, he lost his wife, he lost his house, and he found himself homeless. And I knew another man who um, actually was a drug addict, but he was always trying to get himself clean. And I actually helped him put together a resume. And some months later, I ran into him again, and he looked bright, and he'd had a job, and he was clean. Um, 
Since then, I've also worked with um, organizations such as the Rescue Mission in San Francisco and San Diego. Uh, we, we actually have successful programs to help people get back on their feet with job training, daycare for their children. And after a year-long program, um, there's actually a really high success rate. And we provide clothes to these men and women so that they uh, appear appropriate for job interviews and, and for the jobs that we help them get. Um, so in the meantime, I feel like these bills are inappropriate as long as we don't provide actual options. The second testifier, I know there's been a number of testifiers, but the second testifier who showed very little understanding and empathy, he interestingly, interestingly ended his testimony by pointing out that the shelters are full. That means, that actually means we need more shelters. If we don't have a place for them to go, where exactly do we expect them to go? Walk into the ocean? These bills today are a glaring paradox. You cannot outlaw things that you are not providing alternatives to. Maybe a restaurant or hotel will let an, a tourist or someone like you and me use their restroom, but I know that they wouldn't let a homeless person use their restroom, their restaurant, restaurant restroom. Um, there have been social experiments who show that normal people, just as homeless people, are treated differently. I think once we are addressing the actual problem, we can then consider these bills in good conscience. On a final note, imprisoning people actually costs a lot of money. I'm testifying spontaneously today, so I don't have a figure. But based on the figure of approximately $100 per person per day, that is $36,000 per person per year. Multiply that by the number of people you incarcerate. Will the visual impact of one person be worth $36,000. Be sure to weigh that against the value that you place on tourist income. So I just ask you today to please do your due diligence and try to solve the real problem first. Mahalo for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. <laughs> Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions, anyone else? Sir, yep, yeah, please state your name for the record. And anyone else, please line up behind this gentleman. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, Chair, Council Members, for this opportunity to testify. My name is Steve Miller, candidate for City Council, and I am opposed to these bills. There have been a no I have a number of concerns with these bills. To start with, I have serious doubts about their constitutionality. If passed, the city will get sued. And I've seen some statements in the press attributed to members of this body that uh, could be summed up as, bring it on. Passing a bill and fighting it out in the courts strikes me as a cavalier attitude towards taxpayer money, our money. Money, as I'm sure you're all aware of, the city does not have an infinite supply of. So when you pass a bill, there will be what's known as opportunity cost involved. Opportunity cost simply means that when you spend a dollar on an item, there's one less dollar you have to spend somewhere else. How much money has already been spent, wasted, fighting over laws such as this? How many hours of city employee time, Honolulu Police Department time, have already been used? I say that the time and money will be better spent dealing with the problem of homelessness rather than trying to outlaw basic human functions. Now, nobody denies the importance of, you know, the tourism industry or uh, Waikiki to the state of Hawaii. But it will be much more expensive to deal with homelessness through the criminal justice system than through other methods, whether it's housing first, safe zones for families to sleep with a police presence so they don't have to worry about sweeps, and uh, you can get the children in a safe area. Because if we don't take care of these children, we're just raising our next generation of homelessness, criminals, and drug addicts. Uh, one last point. I don't know what you all believe happens when you die, whether you think you're going to meet St. Peter, ancestral relatives, or going to wait to see what reincarnation has in store for you. If it's anything other than the eternal dirt nap, do you really want to say to those that you meet, yes, I passed a law that criminalize being the poorest of the poor. I urge you to reconsider. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? No, thank you, sir. Thank you for coming forward. Next testifier, state your name for the record, offer your testimony. My name is Chris Seibeneiker, and I'm a street performer, artist in Waikiki. And um, I'm concerned on who's going to determine whether you're homeless or you get this uh, ticket citation. And also concerned on uh, doesn't it conflict with another bill that allows a table and chair on the sidewalk at the time? That, true, true it does. I mean, there is a bill that allows you to have a table and chair on the sidewalk currently, right? So, and uh, on the other hand, 
the troublesome homeless that I do see often in the street in Waikiki could easily be picked up for a variety of reasons that are, you know, they don't have to be for using the bathroom or lying down. The ones that are creating trouble could be just simply observed and, and found breaking several of the laws. Um, and uh, to top it off, what's going to stop them from getting a wheelchair and sitting out there? If they can't lay down or they can't sit down, they could find a wheelchair and just camp out anyway, you know? So that's all. Okay, thank Mahalo. you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions? Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Michael Daly. You know that I've been um, testifying here for probably a decade, almost a decade, on every homeless issue that comes up. Um, I used to, we used to talk about home housing first at that time, at the early time. When you were passing bills about closing the parks and you did that, you prohibited carts and tents in the parks for the homeless. You uh, passed laws to search and seize and take property. You passed a law, Bill 39, for the public utility zone down the, a corridor down the centre of the sidewalk in certain areas and um, others. And we've been talking about Housing First at every time, and I don't know why you don't get the first part, because you've passed all these laws, and you, you, over the period I've begun to see some, uh, oh, I don't know, life intelligence um, about Housing First. There's actually a budget all allocated for it now. However, all these other bills uh, were done first. And, I'm here to testify for uh, Save Waikiki Sidewalk. I'm an artist on Kalakaua Avenue. I do portrait art. Um, like the, my, my colleague who just spoke about um, trouble on the sidewalk, the worst trouble we see, and we're there every night, is um, disorderly conduct. And there's the law, isn't it? You don't need any other law to fix the problem on Waikiki. At the committee meeting last week, I said that it looks to me like the Waikiki Improvement Association, the Waikiki Business District, which seemed to direct things in Waikiki to the point of directing the mayor and the council, that those organisations have allowed the, the, the situation to become intolerable and, and critical in Waikiki. And the reason I'm suggesting that is that I see so many issues where the police need to step in with the firmest possible hand and, and arrest people. Instead, if they come to a 911 call at all, they will uh, talk to the, to the intoxicated person or, yes, usually they're intoxicated or they're having suffering withdrawals and that's why they're creating disturbance on the street. They need a fix, whether it's alcohol or, or whatever. But those are, the, those are the people who are most worrying and most problematic. They're the ones that don't, I don't see getting arrested mostly. Um, Waikiki, let me tell you about Waikiki Improvement Association and the Business Improvement District, these two multinational corporate uh, associations in Waikiki. These are the Wall Street of Honolulu, right? Honolulu City and County Council. And they provide $75,000 each year, as you know, because you approve it each year, a gift to the Honolulu Police Department to address sidewalk issues. In other words, paying a police, the police department to go and arrest A, B, C and D pay for services. There's got to be something unconstitutional about that. And I am a victim of it because I've been arrested multiple times, handcuffed and fingerprint, searched, bashed in jail, and, um, and suffer fines and a record and so on. The artists are at real risk of being pulled into this because it prohibits commercial activities. I have provided uh, a nine-page, or I will provide a nine-page written testimony, which I'd like for you to look at and study. 
I'd also recommend you look at and study Catherine Zion, who spoke earlier, because her testimony is, uh, her written testimonies are full of uh, fact and, um, and links. Um, um, on the, as, as, far, as far as the artists are concerned, the artists rely on free speech to, to be able to be on the sidewalk to do what they do. We appreciate that, uh, not as uh, an entitlement, not as, as a privilege, but as a right. We expect that same right to be extended to every person on the sidewalk, including the homeless. It's not unlawful to look untidy or scruffy on the sidewalk. It's not even unlawful to lie down and, uh, uh, and sit or have any sort of posture on the sidewalk. That's a, that's a freedom of expression. In the bill, it talks about um, making it illegal to even sit at a place that can be construed as an ent a venue of entertainment. Th there are many parts of this bill, and I'm not going to have time to get to them, unfortunately. In fact, sir, I'm going to ask I, you chair? to come to a conclusion. I used to like the good old days when you used to say that, oh, we're passing these bills because they were, they're, um, uh, the, because they're necessary for, for everybody and the, the fact that they happen to um, um, uh, criminalise the homeless is an in, in, inadvertent consequence. You, you used to come up with that. Now we, we, you, you seem to have a full meeting uh, and openly discuss the issue of homelessness uh, thereby uh, providing evidence that this is to target homeless, this is a discrimination issue. This will come to federal court. You know that um, the, the economic and safety issues of Waikiki um, are important to your body. I understand that. But every time the court has come to these issues, the, 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 um, the, f the freedom of speech element on the sidewalk is paramount and cannot be um, eliminated or reduced. Um, the, it's, up to the, it's, it's up to you to prove that any impact that somebody is sitting on the sidewalk is uh, having a, an impact on the economy and a substantial impact on the economy. Thank you, sir. You I'm going to have to that. ask you to conclude that, for, so we, to allow the next testifier to testify. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you for letting me go over. Members, any, any questions for the testifier? If not, thank you, Mr. Daly. Next testifier, please state your name for the record. Offer your testimony, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, my name is Ashish Hamrajani. I'm a graduate student in anthropology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I've been conducting research on homelessness in Honolulu uh, since 2009, so going on five years now. Um, I strongly oppose bills 42, 43, 45, and 46, which all seek to criminalize the basic activities of the chronically homeless. I recommend that you seek the counsel of experts and advocates that, ex that have experience working with homeless people regularly, as we all share the goals of getting homeless people off the streets. I also recommend that you, uh, re I also recommend that you oppose current legislation, or at least defer until you can adequately address all of the concerns that I outlined below. Basically, I have uh, three main points that I'll try to go through succinctly. Criminalization is um, ineffective, it's more expensive, uh, and it violates basic rights. So the intent of these bills rests on the assumption that the current shelter system is adequate to meet the needs of those being charged with criminal offenses. Councilman Anderson has claimed uh, that he has been told continuously that our shelters do in fact have dozens of beds available on any given night to shelter those folks who need shelter. If this is the case, he should be able to cite this information and amend the language of the bills to require the police, whose obligation it is to serve and protect, um, to take folks who need shelter to shelter, not to charge them with a crime. If the councilman's claims are accurate and not just rhetoric to force through criminalizing legislation, why is there a need for the bills at all? So I conducted a quick survey uh, online of 19 shelters who have data of how many beds are available. Um, I found that there were 317 individual beds available. 
Um, but this doesn't reflect the ability of these shelters to meet the needs of the people that are affected by your bills. Um, some of the shelters are res restricted to men or veterans or women or uh, long-term transition shelters. Um, additionally, the same source showed that there was a lot more waitlisted people. Uh, 2,166 individuals and 518 households are currently waitlisted for shelter. Why would such an extensive waitlist be necessary if the shelter system could adequately meet the needs of those being criminalized? What steps have the city and state taken to address the needs of the 6,000 people in Hawaii who are homeless at any given time and the 15,000 people that will be homeless at some point this year, besides criminalizing them and a Housing First program that is as yet unavailable and will only serve 100 people? Um, there's a federal group uh, that you should talk to uh, the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. They found that penalizing people experiencing homelessness tends to only exacerbate mental and physical health problems, create or increase criminal records, and result in the loss of key personal documents that can make it even harder for people to access housing services and support they need to exit homelessness. Policies that criminalize homelessness are costly and rarely result in housing stability for individuals and families or an overall decrease in homelessness in the community. Um, so my second main point is that criminalizing homelessness is more expensive than solving the problem. The city council must demand full fiscal accountability before uh, evaluating the merit of these bills in comparison with other approaches that will get the homeless off the streets. Um, all we know so far is that the sweeps which are currently in place called cost uh, $15,000 each. Using this figure, it's been estimated that over $1 million has already been spent under legislation which has already passed. Has the Department of Transportation and the HPD kept track of individuals being swept to determine whether or not and how often they return and need to be swept off sidewalks again? Such data is, uh, is vital to evaluating, evaluating whether or not these measures are at all effective. If the current policy is expanded under current legislation, the city can expect to spend between 1.8 and $4.5 million to reach the entire homeless population. That is, if each homeless person does not return to the sidewalks uh, after being swept. Of course, if each homeless person returns only once, the figure doubles. Um, the problem with making accurate uh, assessments is that there has been no fiscal accountability for the laws that criminalize the homelessness. Sir, I would have to ask you to summarize. I know you're reading from your written testimony that okay. I have right before me. If you can just briefly summarize this. All of the members have your written testimony. Okay, um, so outreach has saved 1,200, 12, in Pasadena it saved 1,200 police hours and was funded by um, $340,000 in grants. Um, Housing First has saved between $1,500 and $31,000 per person. Um, these are clearly more cost effective ways to go, to go about tackling this problem and they're more effective in terms of um, solving the problem. Yeah, I mean, don't pass these laws un until alternatives are available. Um, and if you really want to address the problem of homelessness, address the roots of homelessness. That's about it. Thanks. Thank you, sir. And we do have your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? Not, thank you, sir, for testifying. Next. State your name for the record. Okay. Offer your testimony. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Midori. Do I see my last name, too? Last name, too? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Midori Rumpun Warren. Does someone have to type that out somewhere? Okay. They'll probably good. get you at later. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, hi, good morning. I know you guys are working hard and listening to a lot of us talk a lot. We have a lot to say. Thank you. Um, I'd like to share a quote with you that I heard like once a long time ago. Um, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but it goes a little something like this. What could be a more dangerous way of making decisions than by putting those decisions in the hands of those who, know, who pay no price for being wrong? I'm here to ask you guys, what if you're wrong? What if we're all wrong? Like, what if this is not the best solution? Um, what, what consequences would you guys suffer if you're wrong? Probably not. I mean, you physically don't have to, I mean, would you physically wake them up, take them from the sidewalk, put them in handcuffs, put them, like, Put them, like, take their mugshot, take their, you know, their fingerprint, put them in jail and say, this is the best thing we thought of. Good luck. I just want to ask you guys if you really, really think this is the best shot you guys have at approaching this problem in the right way, because I don't think it really, really is. I was homeless myself. You know, I've been here, like, my whole life. Um, 
and like I used to live under a bridge at Nimitz for a while and like it was kind of like dog eat dog but we were all like really we shared because we really didn't have that much <laughs> so like I noticed that people who don't have a lot are the most giving but people that have more have more to take away how would you guys tell a child like if you see if you explain to a, a homeless guy like on the side of the road we tell them hey that guy's a criminal that's wrong that like he's sleeping on the sidewalk how do you would you explain that to them would you tell them that he's wrong for sleeping there would you tell your kids or your family that this is tough love and we're showing them that they have better ways to live their lives because we think we know better do we know better do we really know better than that <laughs> um would you arrest a tourist sleeping on the sidewalk? Would you arrest him if he was like lying down, beat by the sun? You probably wouldn't arrest him because he probably is there like contributing to the economically healthy neighborhoods <laughs> in Waikiki. Um, and with respect to homelessness, like I feel like when we dominate or even question the right for one to live as one would have a right to, um, I think that's not only a question about the right to public space, but also a question about democracy. Because they don't get to have a say to what happens to them. We are, we are all here like trying to put decisions onto them. That they don't even, not, have you met a homeless guy here besides you know, other people, like very few of them? Have you met like hundreds that have piled into this room? Have they even, do they even know that we're having this hearing about them right now? Probably not. <laughs> So I, I really, really urge you guys to stop these bills or try a little bit harder. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you guys haven't tried hard at all. I'm just saying that there's got to be a better way. How, what have other states been doing or other nations been doing to help with this problem? I heard once in Thailand, like, I'm half Thai. Um, my, like, I'll finish up in like a few minutes, sorry. Um, when they had like a really, really big homeless drug problem um, with like opiates, they told like the king and the queen came down to like all a bunch of provinces and asked the community what they should do. Kind of like what you guys are doing right now in a way. But um, what they did was they told the, the drug people like, hey, you guys like this stuff so much, huh? Like, you wanna grow some? Grow it way over there on that hill, but bring down the flowering parts to bring down to the market twice a week. And, and that's how they saw the drug problem because eventually didn't want it anymore because it was like kind of okay. They weren't seen as like criminals or people who were bad people, but people who are kind of in a different stage in their life. In other countries, like when a person gets jailed, they're forced to go to school or to go into a trade. But here, like they're just forced to get in jail and then they get tossed back out. Like if you get tossed back out, like you're just out there in the middle of the world and and then you have to think to yourself, this is the best my civilization, my civilization, my society has got for me. And I think the best way you can judge a society is by the way they, that they treat the, the lowest people. So thank you and please, please, please reconsider these bills and the language and the authority that you have put onto them. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your testimony. Thank Members, you. any questions for the testifier? No questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir, this is our final testifier, sir. Come, state your name for the record. If you're going to testify, please line up, otherwise I'm going to have to close public testimony, okay? Good Please afternoon, quit, Good afternoon uh, Council Chair and Council Members. Uh, my name is Carl Strobel. I'm a candidate for City Council in District 4. And um, I want to speak out in opposition of these bills. And uh, the reason being is it, it puts an undue burden right now, I think, uh, not only on... Um, the law enforcement who uh, have a heavy burden as they do already, uh, it makes it harder for the city to actually um, combat, or not combat, but actually uh, come up with solutions for, for these issues at hand. I think that more effort, and because it's came up so fast and so hard right now, that that means that we need to move a lot faster and a lot harder on the solutions towards this problem. The, the housing initiative is a great idea, it's a great movement uh, towards all this, but it, it doesn't, it, it needs not to stop there, it needs to continue further and move faster. Um, it's all due to the years of 
constantly taking this issue, which was cropping up and getting bigger, sweeping it under the rug. Well, there's no more room under the rug anymore, and it needs to, it needs to be addressed. And it has to be addressed by uh, providing options for the homeless, not just uh, criminalizing and making, making them, uh, and putting them in a, a worse situation than what they currently are. So I think that um, all efforts, instead of being put on um, pushing forward this bill, these bills, I think all efforts need to be put on solutions in order to fix these problems and allowing the homeless an actual option to maybe even get out of this situation that they are. Because I, I've been spending, haven't been sign waving because I've been out doing a lot of interviews with a lot of the nonprofit organizations and, and gathering this information on this homeless issues and finding out um, what, what options and what solutions would be best suited for our city to save money and actually do the job for the people. And uh, that will conclude as uh, I am in complete opposition of the bills. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions, thank you. Next testifier, please come forward, state your name for the record, offer your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Jun Yang, uh, director for the, executive director for the Mayor's Office of Housing. I just wanted to address uh, the compassionate side of uh, the work that we're doing uh, in the administration on Housing First. Um, why we've worked on Housing First it is to specifically work with our chronically homeless individuals. Uh, the point in time count shows that we have 558 chronically homeless individuals across this island. And we've prioritized uh, the, the highest populations being the Waikiki, downtown Chinatown, and the Waianae Coast. Um, but I wanted to let you know that what we're doing right now through the Hale Omalama effort to, with the city and the state and the um, continuum of care, we're using real data for the first time. The point in time count gave us an idea of what, on any given evening, uh, how many homeless individuals we have. What we are doing now is with the assessments on the ground, we know who and how many um, would actually benefit from the housing first is the, the um, uh, the right housing intervention for a number of the individuals on the ground. What we're finding is that out of those in the urban Honolulu area, we have about 100, about 140 individuals where housing first would be the right intervention. And so this means that uh, we are, with the city has positioned, positioned itself in a very good way to provide the housing for these individuals. And this is, uh, this is just statistics, the data that we've just received from Focused. Um, out of the 525, uh, approximately 30% 30 per, 30 uh, need permanent supportive housing. Um, and another 48, almost 50% need rapid rehousing. But when we're looking at our chronically homeless individuals, these are the ones that for a long, long time, um, our service provider uh, community has not been very well equipped to be able to support in any real way, in any real sustained way. So for many years, it's been difficult. So in essence, we've been passing over the most difficult of our population. We are now creating, with your support, the Housing First initiative to be able to specifically focus our resources for these individuals who not only um, have the highest burden upon our service resources and, our, and taxpayer dollars, but also, if we do nothing, we'll most likely die on the street. Uh, the statistics we've just been able to find is that, on average, these are individuals who are 62 years old, have been on the street for more than eight years. And if we continue to uh, do things the way that we've done, uh, we most likely will keep them on the street longer than they need to be. So Housing First is the right initiative. And what, as you well know, and, and we've been speaking on this in, in the administration, is we are taking these barriers down. No longer are we requiring somebody to do something to get there and say that you've graduated to get into this housing. Now you've proved to us that you are worthy of this housing. We are taking these barriers away and saying, OK, you are now, um, we've been able to assess that you you require the housing, we're gonna put you in and, and allow, uh, match you up with the social services. Uh, two more things really quickly. We are also working with the service provider industry to retool the system so that we can better use the resources that we have, the federal funding that comes through our, our um, agencies. Um, and the last thing is, yes, Matthew Doherty spoke before you uh, at the last hearing. He is working with our, uh, with our city and the state 
Uh, he is with the U.S. ICH, United States Interagency um, Council on Homelessness, and we speak with him uh, on a very regular basis on what is uh, the best practices for us to do to address our homeless issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for Mr. Yang? No questions? Thank you. Next testifier, please come forward, state your name for the record, offer your testimony. Aloha, I'm Cecilia Gay, and uh, I'm here to uh, testify in opposition to some of these bills that criminalize uh, homelessness. I really enjoyed uh, Mr. Yang's testimony because I firmly believe in housing first also. Uh, my experience with uh, the homeless population comes through my work at OCCC. Uh, I'm a fourth year doctoral student and got to work firsthand with some of these individuals. And I wanted to tell you about one person in particular who uh, came into the system in 2010. Now, I met him last year. Uh, looking up his history, I learned that this gentleman has been through OCCC 32 times. Two times after that, so uh, a two year study at the universe, or at, in Texas showed that. The average person, uh, it, it takes about $15,000 per overnight visit for each individual that, that comes into the jail system. So this particular man coming in a total of 32 times when I met him, 34 when I left, um, he has cost the state $2 million since 2010. Boy, we've, we could have housed him and a whole group of people with that money. So you know, I want to add my, my support of this housing first because these initiatives uh, are not new ideas. They actually have already implemented uh, programs like this in, in, in uh, cities in Florida and New York. And now the state of Utah is actually, they implemented this in 2011. They had a 10-year plan to eradicate homelessness. And guess what? The, the program is so successful and no questions asked, permanent supportive housing, that they actually are looking at eradicating the homeless problem in Utah by 2015 because it's so successful. And it's saving everybody money. You know, I feel compassion for these business owners in Waikiki who have to deal with the homeless who, you know, who are laying on the sidewalks, uh, who are showing the shame of, our, our, of Hawaii, you know, because we're not caring properly for these folk. But if we're going to have real solutions to these problems, we have to get at the heart or the root of the problem. And these, these chronic homeless people, the number one issues are mental illness, substance abuse. Now, one state did a study and they found that to treat somebody for alcohol uh, addiction, it costs about between eight and 10,000. But for a homeless person, it costs about 14,000. So, each individual that, that is suffering from an addiction, we can save money that way. The state of Utah is finding that if they provide the permanent supportive housing, they actually get more funding because they're hooking, up, hooking them up with SSI, SSDI. Now they're using medical insurance. Uh, they're getting money through Section 8. They're getting cash assistant, assistance. And 10% of them are actually now, now have other income sources. So the program is, is working. So I'm, I'm asking you guys just to please consider, uh, this gentleman has been here 10 years advocating for this. This is surprising because I, I know that in Hawaii we want to save money. So let's look at this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions. Thank you, ma'am. Our final testifier, please, sir, state your name for the record. Offer your testimony. Hello, everybody. My name is Ted Connie Mori. I'm from Kaneohe. And uh, I, first of all, I appreciate you guys all coming out to Kaneohe. Saves me the trouble of having to drive, uh, use the bus to go into City Hall. Anyway, uh, I'd like to talk about Bill 43 and 46. Uh, I am against the language in the bill. Uh, this past week, the newspaper says that uh, since 2008, 230 some odd citations were issued for defecation and urination in public. And it doesn't mention anything about the fines or the penalties. Yeah. Um, these bills that are on the table right now 
I'm unclear as to the purpose of the bill. Is the bill to uh, explain to everyone or restate the fact that urination and defecation in public creates a public hazard or health risk? Is it uh, to tell people that you shouldn't urinate or defecate in public? Or is it to scare the people by having more fines, all, all of which the people can't pay because they don't have money in the first place? Or are you going to throw them in jail, and which they say, oh, uh, well, I got a free meal and uh, some place to sleep. So I'm unclear as to what the, the bill is for. And the resultant of this bill, the purpose of the bill, uh, I'd, I'd like to really know more about it. Yeah, because uh, taking liberties, I, uh, with all due respect to the authors, uh, a comedy show used the word jibber-jabber. Yeah. Uh, these two bills, to me, personally, uh, are jibber-jabber uh, because they uh, don't say much about what, do you, what is it that you want to do. A good example is the, uh, the bills that talk about lying, uh, camping, sitting on sidewalks. We've been dealing with that for years already. And all we see is more bills and more bills and more bills because the bills don't uh, aren't inclusive of everything that is supposed to be a purpose for. Yeah. And th this thing over here just says that urination and defecation is bad. So what? Yeah. So uh, again, I apologize if I offend anybody by using the word jibber jabber, but that's, that's what I consider. You know, I, I don't want the, uh, I'm against the city council creating more and more laws and bills that don't do anything. Yeah. Fill the books with laws that don't do anything because we have enough problems enforcing the laws right now. As I said, 230 citations already says that they shouldn't urinate and defecate in public. Yeah, what is the purpose of these two bills? So I'm against it. And uh, thank you again for coming out to Kaniohi. OK, thank you, sir. Members, any questions for the testifier? No questions. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to end public Aloha. testimony after this lady. Go ahead. Aloha. My name is Laulani Teal. Um, I'm with the Ho'opai Pono Peace Project. I work in community problem solving. Um, and I'm sure that this has been covered very well um, from what I've seen. I would just like to bring a couple of, um, a, a couple of points. So if, if you don't mind, I don't actually have enough copies for everyone, but if I could give you something and you can share. Okay. The first thing that I wanted to bring everyone's uh, attention to is the um, is a report dated the 23rd of April 2014, and this is from the um, this is from the the Human Rights Committee of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights of the United Nations, um, and basically it reviewed a number of civil rights questions for the United States. Um, and this is an overall United Nations review, yeah. Um, so what I would like to draw your attention to is very short, and it's on page eight. It's point 19 of the findings. And this is, I want to um, say that this is the way that the United Nations, and basically I think we could say the world, that the world is viewing the treatment of houseless people in the United States. And I think that what's happening here is a reflection of that. So point 19 says, the criminalization of homelessness. Um, and it, it basically says, um, 
The, the committee is concerned about reports of criminalization of people living on the street for everyday activities, such as eating, sleeping, sitting in particular areas, etc. The committee notes that such criminalization raises concerns of discrimination and cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment, and it cites several human rights violations that that pertains to. This is, these are the international standards. Yeah? Um, its recommendation is that the state party, uh, otherwise the, the, um, the city or uh, state district should, A, abolish the laws and policies criminalizing homelessness at state and local levels, B, ensure close cooperation among all relevant stakeholders, including social, health, law enforcement, and justice professionals at all levels to intensify efforts to find solutions for the homeless in accordance with human rights standards, and C, offer incentives for decriminalization and the implementation of such solutions including by providing continued financial support to local authorities that implement alternatives to criminalization and, and I think the city should take note of this, their recommendation is withdrawing funding from local authorities that criminalize the homeless. So I think that you know, the international position on these measures is very, very clear. And I don't think that it should be ignored. It should be taken um, into account and taken very, very seriously. Um, I mean, you don't have to have a copy of the Kanawe Mamalo I accidentally passed them off. I would have to ask you to come to a conclusion. Okay, absolutely. Um, I also passed out a copy of, um, of Kanawe Mamalo Hoi. The, um, which is, thank you, which is, uh, this is the first law of Hawaii. This is the law upon which all other laws are based. It was declared by Kamehameha I. And I just like to conclude by reading that because I think it's not unclear at all. It says, e naka naka. E ma lama o koi ke akua, a e ma lama hoi ke kanaka nui a me kanaka iki. E hele ka ele makule, ka lua hine, a me ke kama, a moi ike ala. A ohe mea nana e ho opilikia, heaven o make. And translated, that means, O oh people, Honor and care for God, care for the divine. Respect the rights of the powerful and those who are humble as the same. May our aged, our women, and our children go forth and lay upon any path without being harmed or troubled. Break this law and die. That is the law of Hawaii upon which all other laws are based. It is designed to protect the weak from the strong. And I ask you as the strong to please protect those who it is your obligation to protect. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> members, any questions for the testifier? Not, thank you. Okay, members, we are moving in discussion. I'm gonna take each of the bills up individually. Members, any discussion on Bill 42? No discussion? Councilmember Harimoto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I speak in strong opposition. I said a lot about this in committee, and uh, I'm going to review some of my notes here. Uh, but first, let me make an observation. A few months ago, perhaps last year, um, when the first bill came to us about uh, making it illegal to lie on the sidewalk, uh, this council swore that it wasn't about attacking the homeless. We said we were not targeting the homeless. But here, just a few short months later, lo and behold, it is about the homeless. We're talking now about the homeless 
causing this huge problem blocking our sidewalks that we need to make a law to make lying and sitting in the sidewalk illegal. But just as an observation, so something changed. Uh, were we not being honest back then? Not sure, just an observation. Um, we all agree there's a huge problem in Waikiki. Uh, we heard all the testimony earlier. I don't think any of us disagrees that it's a serious problem, especially in Waikiki, so that's a given. But let's look at some of the facts. Um, and again, I said a lot of this in committee last week, and I'm just going to repeat it because it's this. This is important. The issue of homelessness did not occur overnight. It's been years and perhaps decades in the works. And what have we done in the past? I would venture to say that government, government has been negligent and we just looked the other way while the problem grew, but it was there. And some say it's a crisis situation, perhaps. But I think the problem is that the problem did not occur overnight, so why are we looking for a solution overnight? It doesn't work that way. And making this kind of law really doesn't make the problem go away. Um, as we heard from the testimony, we need to look at the root cause. We can say, yes, we made a law and pat ourselves on the back, but how did that help? I'm not sure. The homeless people won't disappear because we make a law, that's for sure. What we know is that the chronic homeless are homeless for a reason, and we need to give them support. I think that's a given. We hear that existing shelters has, may have space, okay, even if that's true, if that is a fact, which I don't know, but let's say that's a fact. Also a fact is the chronic homeless cannot go into these existing shelters. These existing shelters are traditional shelters that the chronic homeless cannot be accepted into. That is a fact. So I think we're talking apples and oranges. Another factor in this is that these shelters typically have time limits. You cannot stay in that, those shelters forever. So they have to move on. Where do they move on to? Back to the streets, I, I would imagine. I mean, these are all things we have to consider. And I think one, one big issue is that finally we have the state, the city, and the social service agencies all working together. The states has convened this, this interagency council on, on homelessness. I attended the last meeting. They're making great progress, fantastic plans. Let's give them a chance to implement those plans before we make these kinds of laws. I think what they're doing will truly make a difference. But let's not trump them with this law. I think we all agree also, another fact, as, as far as I can see, we all agree that Housing First works. The data shows it works. It's successful city after city after city. It works. So let's say we agree that Housing First works. Housing First. It's called housing first for a reason. It's not housing second or housing last. It's housing first. These homeless people need a place to go. So let's be sure we have the housing first, give them the support systems they need before we consider implementing a law like this. At the committee meeting, we heard the administration testify that some of these things will be in place by August 1st. I'm kind of doubtful August 1st will happen. Serious doubtful. But let's say even if some of it does, we need to consider how much of it will be in place. Probably very little, 
I think at best the city is looking at 10 housing units. But as we've heard from the testimony, there's um, something like 500 plus uh, chronic homeless, um, which of which they assess 140 are suitable for housing first. 10 units, 140 people, I don't think so. But let's talk about the root cause. One of the big root causes that I think all experts agree on is the lack of affordable housing. Severe shortage of affordable housing. We've heard that time after time after time. So let's not look at attacking the issue of homelessness in isolation of the root cause solution, which is more affordable housing. So we need to put all of these things into perspective and let's not just say, pass one law, we've done our jobs, pat ourselves on the back. I don't think it works that way. Um, and I've talked before about the partnerships with Waikiki, the community, the residents, the businesses, the organizations, um, we need to do that. But I think the most important point is that we cannot view the homeless as problems. We cannot view the homeless people as just a problem to sweep under the rug. They are people. They are people. And I think we need to approach this issue with compassion and love. I mean, that's, that's the way we do it in Hawaii. And again, I'll say, I'll just conclude by saying, my faith guides me in what I do. The facts, I think, are aligned with my faith in saying that we need to provide the support first housing first. And I just can't see us doing it any other way. So I am in strong opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. <laughs> Council Member Pine. Ready? Ready. I feel like we need to slow down a little bit. Uh, we're moving so fast to want to solve this problem that we've forgotten the great gains that we just made. We allocated $47 million for homeless and housing first. I'm so proud of that. I've been working with the homeless for 10 years now and I've had some really wonderful personal success stories where people came from nothing and now they're in a home, they have a job, they're taking care of their kids. There's some sad stories to deal with the same people that we're trying to get off the streets right now. And sometimes we just can't get to them. But I think we need the programs and successes that we have just made to start something, a chance to be implemented. And so I'm in opposition of this bill because we need to just move slower and move step by step, build home by home, apartment by apartment, and actually fund the operations to successfully run housing first. And we need to work with administration to fast track these projects. And then if it doesn't work, then let's just throw everything on the table once again and see what else can, but I have seen housing first work. And some of my constituents were against it, saying we're giving a free ride to people. Sometimes we were, but most of the time, most people are good people and they just want to make a living and get out of your way. So I cannot in good conscience, while we're still working on the solution, how we funded the solution, we just need to give it a chance. I do feel for the businesses who have been so frustrated with us leaders because we haven't done anything for so many years and they have every right to fight for their, their well-being. But I just ask for their patience, just maybe six more months while we get things going. I ask them to help a little too. I know they have, but I think they need to give a little more 
so that we can have those public-private partnerships where we can fast track some of these, these projects. I respect my council members who are for this issue because I know you're frustrated too. But for my district, I know that I can say that we cannot in good conscience support a law like this without solving the real problem first. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion, members? Bill 42. No further discussion? Okay, members, any objections to Bill 42? Noting the objections of Council Member Pine and Council Member Harimoto. Reservations, members? Reservations from Council Member Monahan. Committee Report 205 has been adopted and Bill 42 has passed second reading. Bill 43, members, any discussion on Bill 43? No discussion? Any objections? No. Okay. Any reservations? Noting no reservations, Committee Report 206 and Bill 43 has passed second reading. Okay, members, Bill 45. Any discussion on Bill 45? No, Council Member Monahan. Chair, you know, I noted my reservations on the previous bill. Uh, I do uh, support the intent of the bill in that. Um, on the previous bill, the, uh, it, because it, 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 it does affect the, um, you know, the Waikiki Special District, which is, you know, a, a major um, generator of our revenues for, for the entire state. Um, having said that, um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy, easy decision to make, but um, I would like to just maybe uh, see how that bill works uh, in terms of how we move forward with uh, other uh, proposals such as bills 45 uh, and so uh, for this particular measure I will be voting in opposition okay. thank you any further discussion on bill 45 members no further discussion oh vice chair Anderson thank you mr. chairman a strong support of bill 45 uh, I'd like to thank you mr. chairman for your willingness to hold a special meeting to consider a number of these bills recently. And I'd also like to thank the members of the council, especially the members of the Zoning and Planning Committee that moved these measures forward so that we can consider them here today for second reading. As I've stated before, Mr. Chairman, on multiple occasions throughout my tenure on the Honolulu City Council, no individual has the right to permanently occupy public space at the expense of the general public. I continue to subscribe to that belief. I will forever dis uh, describe to that belief. And Mr. Chairman, I think it's clear that we need to ensure, this council needs to ensure that every member of the public has free and equal access to our public areas. And that's something, Mr. Chairman, that I, as I just mentioned, I will always, always prescribe to. I believe in moving this particular bill forward, we will alleviate the concerns of the other communities who have shared with so many members their fear of folks moving from one community to another community if we are simply going to try to implement a policy in just certain areas or possibly even in just one area of the island. I know Council Member Kobayashi's constituents have shared concerns with her I know that Council Member Fukunaga's constituents have shared concerns with her. And I can sit here before you this afternoon and tell you unequivocally that my constituents have shared the same concerns with me. And that's why, Mr. Chairman, rather than throwing forward another proposal simply aimed at my home council district, I came forward with something that I thought would be more workable in looking to implement such a policy island-wide. I would point out, Mr. Chairman, that this measure, if it does advance forward, will be going back to the Committee on Zoning and Planning for a final round of vetting before the committee. We will have the opportunity to dialogue with the administration to see exactly what progress they've made. We'll have the opportunity to also talk, hopefully, with the meeting being back in Honolulu, at Honolulu Hale, have the opportunity to talk with some of our providers, some of our shelter providers, to see exactly what they've been doing and hear from them what their statistics are in the shelters that they have available or they may not have available. We've consistently heard from our providers that on any given evening, 
they have shelter space available. That's been shared with IHS on a number of occasions. Anyone can go back and check minutes of prior council meetings, prior committee meetings, and see that that is in fact a fact, that that has been shared with this council. But I don't believe, Mr. Chairman, that we can sit here and wait for another six months or even another three months to do nothing and wait for the problem to go away. We need to ensure that all of our citizens have equal access to the public areas that they have a right to access. That's what this is about, Mr. Chairman. I'm proud to support Bill 45, and I'd like to ask my colleagues on the council to join me in sending it back to the Zoning and Planning Committee. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair. Any further discussion on Bill 45? No further discussion? Members, any objections to Bill 45? Noting objections from Council Members Monahan, Harimoto. Okay. Any reservations, members? Reservations from Council Member Menor and Council Member Chang. Committee Report 207 has, a, has been adopted and Bill 45 has passed second reading. Finally, members, Bill 46. Any discussion on Bill 46? Seeing no discussion, any objections? Objections from Council Member Harimoto and Council Member Pine? Any reservations? Noting no reservations, Committee Report 208 has been adopted and Bill 46 has passed second reading. Members, any announcements? Any announcements? No announcements? A reminder, the August 13th, 2014 Council meeting will be held at the University of Hawaii, West Oahu. There is a possibility of the Council convening a special meeting later this month. That, that special meeting, if we do convene, will be held in Honolulu, probably at Mission Memorial, if it's available. Okay, Vice Chair Anderson for the motion to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Council stand adjourned until Wednesday, August 13th, 2014, at 10 a.m. at University of Hawaii, West Oahu. I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. I know there's no objections or reservations. The meeting is adjourned until Wednesday, August 13th, at 10 a.m., University of Hawaii, West Oahu. Thank you, everyone.